Next, we will discuss systemic hypertension. Systemic hypertension is defined as a blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. And this is a measurement that should be made at least three separate clinic visits. The risk factors for hypertension include increased age, obesity, diabetes mellitus, tobacco smoking, also genetics, as well as race. African Americans most commonly associated with hypertension, followed by whites and then Asians. 90% of hypertension is essential or primary hypertension and is commonly related to increased cardiac output or increased total peripheral resistance. The remaining 10% of hypertension is mostly secondary to renal disease or some other secondary cause. Patients with malignant hypertension may develop rapidly progressing hypertension with severe end organ damage. Hypertension predisposes to atherosclerosis because of increased turbulence at the level of the endothelial cell, as well as left ventricular hypertrophy, stroke, heart failure, renal failure, retinopathy, and aortic dissection. All of these complications are referred to as end organ damage and are the reason that we try to control patients' blood pressure as well as we can. Patients with hyperlipidemia, that is, elevated cholesterol levels or elevated triglyceride levels, may develop the following signs. Uh, first, atheromas, which are a collection of lipid plaques within the blood vessel walls. And as you know, these can be very complicated in patients that have stroke, myocardial infarction. These patients may also develop xanthomas. Xanthomas are plaques or nodules that are composed of lipid-laden histiocytes in the skin and are commonly seen in the eyelids, where they're referred to as xanthelasma. Tendinous xanthomas are commonly only seen in familial hyperlipidemias, and these are lipid deposits in the tendon, classically in the Achilles tendon. Corneal arcus is a finding that is seen usually in elderly patients that denotes lipid deposits in the cornea, and these patients are often referred to as arcus senilis. Not all patients with arcus senilis will have hyperlipidemia. Arteriosclerosis is thickening or hardening of the arterial wall. There are three major causes of arteriosclerosis. The first is Monkeyberg arteriosclerosis. This is an idiopathic calcification of the media of the arteries. The arteries commonly involved in Monkeyberg arteriosclerosis are the radial and the ulnar arteries. Usually this is a benign process. These patients present with pipe stem arteries. And although the arteries are thickened, generally there is no obstruction of blood flow because the intima or the innermost portion of the artery is not involved. Arteriolosclerosis is hyaline thickening of the smaller arteries. This is commonly seen in essential hypertension or diabetes mellitus. The classic finding on microscopy is hyperplastic onion skinning that is commonly seen in malignant hypertension. Arteriosclerosis in the kidney can lead to renal failure. Atherosclerosis primarily affects the intima and causes the formation of fibrous plaques and atheromas. As you know, when atheromas rupture, they can cause strokes and heart attacks. Atherosclerosis is a disease of the elastic arteries and the large and medium-sized muscular arteries. So that includes the aorta and, for example, the renal arteries, the coronary arteries, and the cerebral arteries. Arteries with atherosclerosis will generally be narrowed, and this is due to infiltration with lipid as well as calcification. The risk factors for atherosclerosis include smoking, hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, hyperlipidemia, and a positive family history. It's thought that atherosclerosis begins with endothelial cell dysfunction. When endothelial cells are damaged, it exposes the collagen underneath them, and macrophages and LDL accumulate under the endothelial cell. 
Foam cells are macrophages that have taken up large amounts of lipid. Foam cells accumulate and form fatty streaks, which are collections of foam cells. Under these fatty streaks, smooth muscle from the media migrate into the area of the plaque. This migration is thought to involve PDGF, or platelet-derived growth factor, and fibroblast growth factor beta, which in general leads to the formation of a fibrous plaque and a complex atheroma. A complex atheroma generally includes calcification and may have the presence of an ulceration on the inside of the vessel. The complications of atherosclerosis include aneurysm, when the atheroma becomes so thick that it invades into the wall and causes a weakness, as well as ischemia of the downstream tissue, such as coronary blockages leading to myocardial ischemia and infarct, as well as peripheral vascular disease, when the atherosclerosis involves the lower extremities, such as the femoral arteries, as well as thrombus and emboli. The most common locations for atherosclerosis include the abdominal aorta, the coronary arteries, the popliteal arteries, and the carotid arteries. The symptoms of atherosclerosis depend on where the atherosclerosis is located. So, for example, with coronary arteries, a person may have angina. With the lower extremities, they may have claudications. But also remember that atherosclerosis may be asymptomatic. Unfortunately, 50% of patients with a lethal myocardial infarction will have no symptoms prior to their MI.